Last night when we talked about the Samanyapala Sutta, the jhanas showed up and it was the four jhanas. But there are four additional states that are sometimes referred to as jhanas. They're not called jhanas in the suttas, they're called the four immaterial states. It was only when we got to the Abhidhamma that they began putting the four jhanas and the four immaterial states together to make the eight jhanas. It's, it's a useful thing because certainly in the suttas we often find the four jhanas as a sequence followed by the sequence of the four immaterial states giving a sequence of eight. This is quite common. So it makes sense to talk about the eight jhanas. Now, the four jhanas that we've talked about are often called the rupa jhanas. Rupa is materiality, but <laughs> these jhanas are not material. They're obviously mental, but they are experiences the likes of which we can have in the material world. There's a simile in the Vasudhimaga that illustrates this. You're lost in the desert. You don't have any water. That's a pretty precarious position. You come over a little rise, and in the distance, you see what might be palm trees. It might be an oasis. You head towards it. It doesn't disappear. And then you run into people. They have wet hair. They have bundles of wet clothing. It's an oasis. You get really excited. First jhana. You come to the oasis, it's beautiful, lots of shade trees, lots of water. You are so happy. Second jhana, you drink the water, you get into the water, you cool off, you clean up, you get out, you are satisfied. And then you lie down in the shade of a tree and have a rest. This actually captures what the movement is like from the excitement to happiness to contentment to peacefulness, a quiet stillness. But these other four states are not like anything in the material world. So in order to enter these states, it's usually necessary to get a very good fourth jhana. When you feel that your fourth jhana is really good and you're ready to try for the fifth jhana, stay longer in the fourth jhana. Right? Let it really build. One thing that happens frequently in the fourth jhana, people find themselves sort of slumped over. It's so well, restful, down, low energy that you just slump right over. That's fine. It's not a problem. Well, maybe except for your posture. This also means that if you're peaking, when you're meditating with a bunch of people and you see somebody slumped over, you shouldn't think, oh, they've fallen asleep. You should think, oh, how nice. They must be in the fourth jhana. So if you find yourself slumped over in the fourth jhana, get your energy back up. Yeah, get, get set up a bit. And then you're ready to start. So I'll read you the description. Here, by passing entirely beyond bodily sensations, by the disappearance of all sense of resistance, and by non-attraction to the perception of diversity, Seeing that space is limitless, one reaches and remains in the realm of limitless space. So the name is the realm of limitless space. You usually see something like the realm or sphere of infinite space. But at the time of the Buddha, they didn't have the notion of zero, so I rather doubt they had the notion of infinity. But they did have limitless or boundless so this is boundless space. And the word that gets translated as sphere, sphere or realm or base is actually the same word that is used for the census. This is the I base. 
the ear base, etc. So not literally correct, we could say one reaches and remains in the experience of limitless space. Because with your eye base, you experience seeing. With your ear base, you experience hearing. With infinite space, you experience infinite space. Now, I should explain these instructions because it may not be exactly clear what you do. By passing entirely beyond bodily sensations. This is why you need a really good fourth jhana. The body is still available. You can become aware of it in the fourth jhana. Remember, one sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind. So the body is still there. But if your concentration is good enough, when you start the movement towards jhana five, you'll just forget about the body. You won't notice it. And by the disappearance of all sense of resistance and by not attraction to the perception of diversity. Uh, probably not real clear. All right, so here are the instructions. Get yourself settled into an upright position and then find something you can expand. Expand without limit. What Ayakema told me was get in touch with the boundaries of your being and then expand them to fill the room. And once you've got that steady, expand them to fill the building. And once you've got that steady, expand them to fill the retreat center. And once you got that, just keep expanding. And when you hit the horizon, keep going. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'll go try that out right away. But I was thinking, oh my God, she's gone new age on me. This is crazy. But Ayakema was not somebody you wanted to say something like that to. I mean, it's just, just yes, ma'am, I'll go try that right away. So I went back and she told me to get a good fourth jhana. So I got a good fourth jhana, right? And then I started the expansion with no expectation at all. I mean, it just seemed nuts. And so, yeah, I could do the room and I could do the building. I could do the retreat center. I could just keep going and going and going and going and going and going. And then all of a sudden, this huge infinite space opened up in front of me. It was like, like you're walking across the Arizona desert. And there's nothing but sand and cactus. And you come to the edge of the Grand Canyon. Only there's no bottom and there's no other side. It was a big space. Blew me away. Well, it turns out, yes, you can expand the boundaries of your being. You could expand most anything. I had one student who took an imaginary balloon and blew it up bigger, 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 bigger until it popped and there was a space. She was also the one that took a flashlight and followed the light further, 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 further until it eliminated the space. I've had people talk about riding rocket ships or taking an elevator. The whole idea is find something that you can expand and expand it without limit. Now, when you're doing that, there has to be the disappearance of all sense of resistance. If you're doing your expansion and it gets stuck, you're going to have to push through it or maybe go in a different direction. So you, you have to just keep going with the expansion. And it's very important you keep your attention out on the edges of the expansion. Further, further, further out. And there's also the non-attraction to the perception of diversity. So when you start... There's the room and then the building, retreat center or neighborhood or whatever, and you just keep going. But when you hit the horizon, go. Don't think about going past the moon, Mars, Jupiter, or anything like that. Just stay with the expansion. If you can stay with the sense of expansion and not look for the space, the space eventually appears. 
If you look for the space, well, you're not focused on the expansion. You're looking for the space and nope, it's not going to appear. It's important to understand that the expansion is not the fifth jhana. The expansion is the method to take you to the fifth jhana. It's like the pleasant sensation. When you shift your attention to the pleasant sensation, that's not the first jhana. You need to stay with the pleasant sensation until the positive feedback loop gets set up and takes you into an altered state. Same with this. You're doing the expansion. Stay with it until the infinite space appears. If you're visual, you'll probably see the space. People who see it generally describe it as either off-white or light gray. It may or may not have a horizon line, or it may show up as black, black outer space, but no stars, moon, Jupiters, galaxies, anything like that right? Because you've gotten beyond perception of diversity. It's just a big empty space, whether it's white, gray, or black. Put your attention on the spaciousness of it. It's a dramatic enough thing that when it occurs, you're like, oh yeah, that's a big space. If you're wondering, uh, is this a big enough space? No, it's not, right? It's Infinite space, limitless space, boundless space. You want to learn to get there and stay there for 10 to 15 minutes. You know, get good at stabilizing it. And after you can do that, then you could try moving on to the sixth jhana. And by passing entirely beyond the realm of limitless space, seeing that consciousness is limitless, one reaches and remains in the realm of limitless consciousness. Uh, the instructions are getting fairly sparse. There's this giant space that you're aware of. Well, you can't be aware of a limitless space with a limited consciousness. Your consciousness has to be as big as whatever it is that you're aware of. Look at the room you're in. You're aware of how big it is. So that means your awareness actually can go out into the room. Same thing's happening with the limitless space and the consciousness that knows the limitless space. So the trick is to simply turn your attention from the space to your consciousness of the space. Become conscious of your consciousness. Become aware of your awareness. It's a trick. It's like a turning back. You, you might want to practice this, you know, look at something in your room. I don't know, a bookcase, a lamp. Look at it. You're aware of it. Now step back and become aware of your awareness of it. Practice that with mundane objects and you'll have a sense of what you need to do to move from five to six. It's not a big shift when you're first learning it. It, it, it's fairly subtle shift, but it is definitely a shift. It, it's more like in five, the space is in front of you. There's a very tiny observer with the space before you. If it's really good, it'll be before you, below you, behind you, but there's still an observer observing something out there. When you make the shift from the space to your awareness of the space, you become the limitless consciousness. It's like when you turn back, you become absorbed into the space and you have a limitless consciousness. Most people describe it as dark. That's it, it's just dark. Uh, nothing more visually there. 
If you're not a visual person in the fifth jhana, you won't see the space, but you'll know there's a big space in front of you. If you're not a visual person in the sixth jhana, it'll probably be just like everybody else's experience. You just know that your mind is limitless. It goes out forever. Now, if you come from a spiritual tradition where the idea is merging with some Atman or some oversoul or something like that, and you find yourself being a limitless consciousness, you may think, yeah, you've accomplished what you needed to do. I mean, of course, right? There's just this infinite consciousness. It must be, it must be everything and I'm it. And so, no, afraid not. What you're having is an experience. You're having an experience that you interpret as experiencing a limitless consciousness. I don't think that there is any infinite consciousness out there that you can tap into. Orthodox Theravadan Buddhism does think there is. Orthodox Theravadan Buddhism says that each of these jhanic states, all eight of them, correspond to one or more of the heavens. And so when you enter a jhanic state, you've actually gone to heaven. And so when you hit the sixth jhana, you've entered the heaven of infinite consciousness. Uh, they're giving it an ontological existence. And I'm going, no, man, you just have any experience and you're interpreting it that you're having the experience of an infinite consciousness or infinite space or whatever it is. So I'm not buying the existence level of it. Sometimes if you get it really strong, this limitless consciousness, it may seem like there are other consciousnesses within this consciousness. A couple little ones down here and a couple little ones over there. It's not like you're able to read the minds of other people in the room or anything like that. It just seems like there must be other consciousnesses within it. I've only had that experience maybe a half dozen times. You need a really good infinite consciousness to, to have that experience. Usually there's just, yeah, my mind is without limit. And that's all that's happening there. As before, you want to be able to stay there 10 or 15 minutes, get good at it. It's also useful when you're playing with the jhanas to do them in both forward and reverse order. When you're learning the jhanas, you might go one, two, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, three, two, one, something like that. And same thing here, one, two, three, four, five, four, five, six, five, six. You just play with going back and forwards it'll give you more a sense of what the essence of the jhana is. It's like, it's like if you're hiking in the woods and you come across a clearing, but you only come from one direction to this clearing, you, you sort of notice it. But if you come from a new direction, you're like, wait, I've been here before. And you're looking around and you're really noticing the details of the clearing much more than you would have if you just keep coming from the same direction. You get a different perspective on it. And it's the same with the jhanas. So when you go backwards to a jhana, you're more aware of the defining characteristics. And it's going backwards is actually much easier than going forwards. You just sort of got to remember what the previous one feels like. And if you're in the first four, feed a little more energy in and you'll pop right back up into the previous. Going from five to four, just, yeah, let everything collapse down that well again. From six to five, you're going to need to become aware of the space again. All right, so now you can hang out in this limitless consciousness and you might want to try for jhana seven. And by passing entirely beyond the realm of limitless consciousness, seeing that there is no thing, one reaches and remains in the realm of no thingness. So 
in the six, there's this limitless consciousness. What is the content of that consciousness? Well, the sense of space is long gone. In fact, there's nothing there. Put your attention on the nothing. I find when I do that, I get a, a ball of nothing, beach ball size nothing. It's just right there. I mean, the, the big, big, yeah, what's there? Oh, nothing. And I let it stabilize and I look at the edge, nothing over there, nothing over here, nothing over there, nothing over, you know, slowly, slowly as I look at the edges, it gets bigger. I got a big nothing. Now it's called the realm of no thingness rather than nothingness. And no thingness is actually a good description. There is no thing to be found. People who are visual describe it as dark, either black, deep purple, dark blue, or possibly they describe it as, remember the old TVs when you tamed it to a channel where there wasn't a station, you got black and white static. Imagine black and black static. So sometimes seven shows up as black and black static. It's nothing there. There's no thing, just the static. Or there's just the void. It's this big empty. People who stumble into the seventh jhana unexpectedly usually freak out because they've fallen into the void. I know this because a number of people have come to me and said, can I tell you about something happened to me? And I say, sure. And they say, well, I, I was on the three-month course at IMS or something like that. And I was just doing my vipassana and I fell into the void. Oh, okay. Tell me. And, you know, they describe it. And I go, yeah, sounds like the seventh jhana. Oh, I don't know. It was really scary. Well, what'd you do? Oh, I went running to the teacher. Well, what'd they tell you? They said to uh, go get something to eat and take a shower and don't meditate for a few days. I'm like, yeah, it was just the seventh jhana. Well, it was really scary. Well, that's because you didn't know what was going on. Don't worry about it. <laughs> they go away. You know, they learn the first six jhanas. Eventually, you know, maybe a couple of retreats later or something, they come back in. They've got six jhana. Okay, here are the instructions for seven. I don't know if I want to go back there. No, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So I give them the instructions. They go away. Three days later, they come back for the next interview. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly where I went. Only this time it wasn't scary. Yeah, it was only scary because you didn't know what it was. If you fall into any of these higher states, but particularly number seven, you don't know what it is and you're afraid you're losing your mind. And so it's scary but you don't need to go get something to eat or take a shower. You just need to relax and enjoy this pretty cool experience. The nothingness is, well, it's not like the emptiness of the Mahayana. We'll, we'll talk about emptiness uh, later in the course, but it's no thingness. It's like you got the cookie jar and you take the top off and there's nothing in it, empty. No thing. It's like you go into the basement, right? And you hit the light switch and it doesn't work. And it's just dark. And you're trying to see what's down there. And you can tell there's nothing right in front of you. And, and, and as your eyes get more accustomed, there's nothing over there either. And they get accustomed enough, there's nothing down here at all. It's that kind of nothing. I mean, look around the room you're in. There, there's tables and chairs and books and things on the wall and curtains. And let's say while you're asleep tonight, somebody comes in and takes everything out. And you come in the next morning and it's like, there's nothing here. It's that kind of nothing. No thing to be found. It's a great place to hang out. It's my favorite jhana. I mean, there's nothing to bother you. And you're really concentrated. And again, you want to get to where you can stay with it for 10 to 15 minutes. It doesn't have that infinite feeling that five and six have. There's just nothing. Usually in front of you, but if it's good, below you, behind you. 
Again, a very tiny observer observing the nothing before him. After you've been there 10 to 15 minutes, you've gotten good at seven and you wanna try for eight, stay longer in seven. You're gonna need a really good seven to find eight. Then, and by passing entirely beyond the realm of no thingness, one reaches and remains in the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. Perception is a translation, the usual translation of the Pali word sanya. Sanya is the ability to name things, to conceptualize them. For example, can everybody see Kuan Yin? You see Kuan Yin? Yeah, yeah. No Kuan Yin here. It's just a colored shape. That's all it is. It's just a colored shape. If I turn it upside down, maybe you see it as just a colored shape. Can you see the flowers? Can you see the bird? No flowers, no bird. It's just colored shapes. You can only see colored shapes and then you interpret it, right? You conceptualize what you're seeing. Now, if I put it like this, kind of shake it a little bit, it doesn't really look like a bird and flowers. It's just colored shapes. It's easier to see this with a painting or a drawing because now when you're looking at me, you see a person. It's harder to see that you're just seeing colored shapes. But that's all you ever see is just the colored shapes. And then there's the step of sanya. And that turns it into an object. So literally, this is the realm of neither sanya nor not sanya. Neither conceptualizing nor not conceptualizing neither identifying nor not identifying, neither naming nor not naming. I don't guess that helped a lot. It's a kind of hard place to describe because you see, it's a state that has no characteristics by which you can describe it. And yet you can recognize, I'm in a state that has no characteristics by which I can describe it. So the no characteristics, and yet you recognize you're in the state of no characteristics, is neither perception or non-perception. That probably didn't help a lot either. It's hard for me to describe because it has no characteristics by which I can describe it. I mean, the good news is if you've got a really good seven, it's fairly easy to find eight. If you got a good seven, it's going to be a big nothing. So let your big nothing collapse and come to rest in front of your face and see if your mind goes into a state that you can't describe because it has no characteristics, but you can stay there. If so, yeah, you probably found number eight. The eighth jhana is far more fragile than any of the preceding jhanas. In the other jhanas, let's say this is the contentment of number three, and this is your one-pointedness on number three. So it's possible to, to waver slightly. You know, you lose your one-pointedness. And when you do, it's not like the contentment disappears. You start losing it, and the contentment starts fading. Boop, you got back in time. And you start wavering, and oop, you're back in time. You can even do that with seven. You got the nothingness and yeah, don't be gone long. If you get back there, it'll, it'll resettle in and establish. But with eight, yeah, you might have time for one simple sentence not containing the words I, me, or mine, right? It's very fragile. I couldn't tell you the number of times I've gotten into the eighth jhana. Good eighth jhana. Yeah, really good one. And then the next thing I know, I'm in the middle of some paragraph of distraction. I have no idea how I got there. And there is not a trace of the eighth jhana left to go back to. I got to go back to seven or five and work my way back up there again. 
I had been practicing the eighth jhana for almost a year before I ever got in it and knew I could stay there as long as I wanted. And that was on a month long retreat, probably three weeks into the month long retreat. So a year's practice and then three weeks of intense practice on a retreat. And yeah, finally I got to where I could stay there for as long as I wanted. And I stayed for about half an hour just because, well, I could finally for the first time. So these are the immaterial states, sometimes called immaterial jhanas. What are they good for? Well, they'll give you a mind that's even more concentrated, clearer, sharper, brighter, more malleable, more wieldy, more given to imperturbability that you can direct inclined to knowing and seeing. It's like the, the jhanas quiet your distractions, quiet your ego making. And if you go to the higher jhanas, that stays quieter longer. If you're in four and you come out and do your insight practice, yeah, eventually your ego and your distraction will come back. If you go to eight and do the same practice, it'll take longer because you're just more concentrated. They're more subtle states and they get you a deeper level of concentration, a deeper level of indistractability. Now, there is a state that's sometimes called the ninth jhana. It's never called that in the suttas, although it's mentioned in the suttas. It's the cessation of feeling and perception. Naroda Vedana Sanya. And it's a state of suspended animation. You might have heard about these Indian sadhus. They dig a hole, put the sadhu in a box, put him in the hole, cover it up. Three days later, they dig him up. He's fine. He does that because he puts himself into the state of suspended animation, the state of naroda. Now, you got to be careful with the word naroda. It gets used a lot. It just means cessation. And there's a lots of cessations that happen in Buddhism. But this is the cessation of feeling and perception. It's not particularly useful state because, well, you're gone. It is said that when you come back, you can watch yourself be regenerated. And that gives you a sense of, oh, I'm constructing the self. And that can be very insightful, anatta. Supposedly, that's how Maha Moggallana, one of the Buddha's two chief disciples, actually managed to become fully awakened, is going into the state of Naroda and then coming out and watch what happens. There's not a lot more I can tell you about it, but a little bit. The first is a documentary on the Kumbha Maya Festival. The Kumbha Maya Festival takes place in India. I believe it's once every 12 years. And this one took place in 2001. It's a big festival. I think 20 million people showed up. Makes Woodstock look like a backyard picnic. And the documentary is called Shortcut to Nirvana. And it's definitely worth seeing. It's actually available, I believe, on YouTube now. So yeah, shortcut to Nirvana, plug it in, see if you can find it. It's quite interesting. I mean, it's got the Dalai Lama. It's got all these weird sadhus. It, very enjoyable. I've watched it a couple of times and found it just really fascinating both times. But one of the scenes, they've dug a pit and they've put a ladder down into it. And this Japanese woman climbs down the ladder into the pit. They pull the ladder out. They put roofing tin over the pit. They cover it with dirt. End of scene. More sadhus, the Dalai Lama, even more sadhus. Three days go by and they come back and they're sweeping away the dirt off the roofing tin. They pick up the roofing tin. They put the ladder down and this woman climbs out all happy. She had to have put herself in the state of Naroda. The astronauts, when they were testing them, one of the things they did was put them in a sensory deprivation tank and see how long they would last. These are the guys with the right stuff. The longest any of them lasted before it got too weird was eight hours. And this woman had been down there for three days. That's a long time. 
she obviously had put herself into the state of Naroda. Another thing I can tell you about it, I was in Thailand one year for Thai New Year's. Thai New Year's takes place at the end of the hot season, the beginning of the rainy season in April. And at that time, the Thais do their spring cleaning. In every Buddhist household in Thailand, there would be a shrine in the house. And as part of the spring cleaning, they would wash the Buddha statue. Well, the tradition had developed that after washing the Buddha statue, you would take some of the water from washing the Buddha statue and sprinkle it on the hands of your elders, saluting their Buddha nature. Well, in modern times, the sprinkling has gotten uh, a bit out of hand. Everybody in the country is throwing a bucket of water on everybody else in the country. It's the world's largest water fight. And it's a very participatory festival. I mean, you step out of your guest house room and you'll be greeted with a bucket of water. You better purchase your own bucket a few days earlier and filled it up before you stepped out of the room. So I was in Chiang Mai, which was really the center of this. And I went down to the main square on the first day of the festival. The Thais had set up spigots all along the main street. Two of them came out of this box. If you put a one bot coin in, which was worth four cents, then water would come out and the Thais had put big barrels under them, like 55 gallon size big plastic barrels. And they'd see me coming and they go, one bot, one bot, because they knew that I needed to reload my bucket because, you know, in walking from my guest house to the main road, I'd obviously used it up. So I put in the one bot coin, now I can reload. And it's chaos. I mean, people coming by on motorcycles and everybody throwing buckets of water at them. A bus comes by, if there's a window down in the bus, yeah, water's going in that window. You're in a car, yeah, you better be rolled up. And yeah, everybody walking on the street is throwing water buckets at everybody else on the street. In the main square, which is right next to the main street there, they'd set up a little pavilion off in the corner you know, not in the midst of the chaos. And there was a monk seated in the pavilion. He was full lotus. His eyes were open and downcast. And he had the most serene look on his face I have ever seen. It was actually quite inspiring to see somebody meditating in the midst of all this chaos. He was there that afternoon when the big parade came by. He was there that night when they had the opening of the beauty pageant about 30 yards away. He was there the next morning, all day. He was there for the second round of the beauty pageant the second night. On the third day, he was still there. Yeah, he looked a little tired, serenely tired. He was there that afternoon when the biggest parade of all comes by. He was there for the finals of the beauty pageant that night. He was gone the next morning. He had to be in the state of Naroda, you know, just not even blinking for, for three days. It, it was quite an inspiring thing to see. The other experience I've had of the state of Naroda was when I was with Powak. Now, this was on the longer retreat I did with him. I was at the forest refuge for two and a half months before he showed up, and then he was there for four months. And I was trying to get to his first jhana. Now, to get to his first jhana, you've got to generate a nimitta, a circle of light. After he was there about a month, I was getting a pretty steady nimitta. So it would only take me three and a half months to get the nimitta going. And, you know, all you got to do then is just absorb into the nimitta. That's how you get to the first jhana. Easier said than done. You're just following your breath. I mean, the nimitta appears and he tells you, don't look at the nimitta, just keep following your breath. If you start paying attention to the nimitta, it'll go away. 
So just follow your breathing. So I'm following my breathing for several hours. I got the nimitta, nothing more. That, that was it. Until one day after lunch, I come back from my walk. And in the afternoons, so I was lying down so I could get a really long session because afternoon was my peak time. And so I'm lying there. I'm a little drifty, come out of it. I'm awake again. And the nimitta appears only this time. It was way more vivid than I'd ever seen before. And I'm going to look at it. And I looked at it and immediately it was 45 minutes later. I mean, I was just gone for 45 minutes. The nimitta never went away, but there was no body, no sense of touch. There were no sounds. There was no passage of time. I'm estimating 45 minutes from... I had my little timer set to know how to how long to count. So I had some idea of how long I'd been meditating before the nimitta appeared. And I looked at the clock when I came out and yeah, I, I pretty much lost 45 minutes. It was just gone. The nimitta never went away, but that's all there was. Now, Powalk says, if it's the first jhana, when you come out, in order to tell where you went, you look at the heart center. And when he said that, I point into the center of my chest and he goes, and he points off to the left side. Okay. So when I come out, I, I look that way. Could I see the five factors of the first jhana? Could I see PT and Sukha? Well, as soon as I looked over there, this sweet wave of PT Sukha comes over me. Yeah, I could see that. All right. I look ahead. Look again, could I see initial attention to the meditation object? Because that's how they translate Vitaka. Yep, I saw that I put my attention on that nimitta. Look up, look again. Could I see sustained attention? That's how they translate Vichara. Yep, I <laughs> sustained my attention on that nimitta. Could I see one point in this? Yeah, that's all there was, was one point in this. So I go to see Powalk and I describe what happened and he goes, good, do for one hour, two hours, three hours. Okay. The next day I had an interview with this French Canadian monk and I go, yeah, is that the first jhana? He goes, yeah, that's the first jhana. So I want to do it again, but I want to see what happens. So I get the nimitta and nothing happens, you know. And if, it took me about three days to realize, oh, if you want to see what happens, it doesn't happen. So don't see what happens. Like, don't think of a pink elephant. Yeah, never got back there. Never got back there. But I was gone. There were no Vedana. There were no Sanya. No feeling, no perception. It was just a state of suspended animation for about 45 minutes. There's a paper by Rod Bucknell of, uh, I believe, the University of Queensland, Australia. And in that paper, he says that the sutta jhanas up through eight, and then stepping into the ninth jhana, the cessation of feeling of perception, is the first Vasudhi Magha jhana. And I'm going, yep, that was my experience. So these are the four immaterial jhanas, the four immaterial states, and the so-called ninth jhana, the cessation of feeling and perception. Any questions? How are you transitioning from the, into these immaterial jhanas? I know like you take a deep breath, you go from two to three. Yeah. With transition technique. So from four to five, you've got to do that expansion thing, right? And it may take several minutes. I mean, usually from one to two to three to four, it's very quick transitions, a few seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, and you're stable. The expansion could take several minutes before it clicks into the fifth jhana. From five to six, it's pretty easy. It's just shift your attention from the space to your consciousness of the space, and it'll stabilize very quickly. 
it's pretty quick to go from infinite consciousness to nothingness. Just find a sense of nothingness and put your attention on it and it'll stabilize pretty quickly. So a few seconds. And to go to eight, collapse the nothingness and see if your mind winds up in a state you can't describe. So yeah, it's a little different trick for each one of those. The breath, yeah, you're not noticing the breath because you've passed entirely beyond all bodily sensations. So yeah, no breath there anymore. You're not aware of it. You're still breathing, but you're not aware of it. But you're, you're cognizant that you're in these states. So you're, yeah. you can move through them. Yeah, you can decide, okay, been here long enough, go to go to the next. And remember what to do to go to the next. So one of the things I really appreciate is that, I mean, I'm here for wisdom and insight. And you're presenting jhanas as a way to have uh, more rich experiences of that, right? right. Like, yeah. like you said, sharpening the knife. Are the, is that the perspective, you know, I guess, is that the perspective with these other approaches? They're all trying to get to that same point of that kind of a mind that can have those kinds of insights. Yeah, exactly. All of them are in the service of come out of the jhana and do some insight practice. Mm -hmm. Although uh, Bhante Gunaratna and Bhante Vimla Ramsi and Tanasaro Bhikkhu all say do your insight practice while in the jhana which means you have to be not very concentrated because when I'm in the jhana, yeah, there's no bandwidth left over to do anything else but be in the jhana. But they're all about do the jhana so you can, your insight practice will be better. Everybody who's teaching jhanas, that's what they're saying. It's sila samadhi panya. And the jhanas are the samadhi step and the panya comes from the insight practice. So yeah, and this is what Powalk and Shaila are saying as well. Definitely. I might have missed it, um, but when you, um, just to clarify, so when you in the jhanas and you're coming out of the jhana and before you do inside practice, you, you go from whatever jhana you are, you think going down or you just do it right, right there kind of. Yeah, it's good to learn them, one, two, three, four, three, two, one. But when you're ready to do insight practice, go out of the highest number you know. So if you know four, one, two, three, four, start doing your insight practice. And you don't have to make the jhana go away. If, if say, you were in fourth jhana and you wanted to do the five daily recollections, you just Say to yourself, I am of the nature to grow old. I'm not exempt from aging. You, know, you just start doing it. If you're doing the body scan, you just put your attention on the head and start doing the body scan. The jhana feeling will fade out, but that's fine. I mean, you've sharpened up your mind. And so it gets dull while you're gaining your insight, but that's the whole idea. The one exception would be the eighth jhana. You're so quiet coming out of it it may not be useful for some practices that there's a lot of mental activity going on. It's not good to come out of the eighth jhana and try to do the five daily recollections because you're just like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> so go back to seven and then come out of seven and you can do any practice you want coming out of seven. But other practices are really good to do coming out of eight choiceless awareness practice, if you've ever done any of that, open awareness practices, those are great to do coming out of eight. I'll talk about Vedana practice tomorrow, working with the Vedana. That's a good one to do coming out of eight as well. So mostly it's go to the highest number you know and start your inside practice. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first is if we go back to that analogy of uh, sharpening Manjushri's sword. Can you give me a sense of how sharp is the sword after, say, number four versus eight versus this ninth one? I mean, how substantial is that difference and how important is that difference in terms of 
the clarity of one's mind. Right. So that's so. Yeah. Okay, let me ahead. do Sorry. one at a time. So I would say there is a noticeable difference, but to quantify it, yeah, I can't do that. And I only was one time in in the ninth jhana, so I can't give you any information. I I was so blown away by the experience, I didn't, you know, I sort of lost whatever it gave me because I was like, well, that was cool. Yeah. And, and I didn't do any insight practice immediately because, yeah, it was just such an unfamiliar state. So I don't know that it was going to give me more or a lot more or anything else. Uh, I just don't have any data there. But it's noticeable, the difference between four and eight. And yeah, if you can get to eight, go to eight. But a lot of times I'll only go to four. You know, I'm more, much more interested in insight than I am in the, the jhanas. So yeah, if I get to four, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, I'm going for insight right now. And the other question? So the second question is um, just to throw yet another um, state into the mix. Uh, so in Zen, the the preferred type of meditation is like an open awareness practice, shikantaza. And I know other traditions have, I think in Tibetan, there's like Dzogchen. I don't know much about it, but I, ha I know that there are other types yeah. of uh, practices that are like that. Do any of these traditions um, combine these two practices in the sense of not combine at the same time, but like, would one be a precursor to the other? Uh, and how would they fit together? Yeah. So Shikantaza, Dzogchen, Mahamudra are excellent insight practices to do post eight jhana. Okay. So I've studied Dzogchen and that's, that I've done a lot of Dzogchen practice. And I've done a lot of Dzogchen practice coming out of the eighth jhana. And no, I'm not going to teach anybody here any Dzogchen. Go see a Dzogchen master to learn that. But these open awareness practices, your mind is much more stable coming out of the jhanas. And so it's possible to rest in the states longer. I don't know of anyone in Zen or Tibetan who's teaching jhanas anywhere. The Tibetans know about the jhanas. They have them as part of their curriculum to get a Geshe degree. So a, a doctor of Buddhism in the Tibetan tradition. And you have to know about the jhanas and they're described like they're described in the Vasudhimaga, but nobody practices them that I can find. Uh, in Zen, there used to be jhana practice and they disappeared I think 14th century, something like that was the last school that was practicing jhanas. I don't re quite remember. I could be wrong. It could be 16th, 18th century. I don't remember. But there's, yeah, very, very little jhana in Zen, which is kind of interesting because jhana is Pali. Dhyana is Sanskrit. Chan is Chinese and Zen is Japanese. And it just literally means to meditate. They're all the same word. Uh, but yeah, no jhanas in Zen these days. And in Tibetan, they're just an academic study. So um, by definition, the immaterial states, there, there is no body. So there's no body in that infinite space, right? It's just the awareness or the consciousness of that space. There's the space and there's a sense of a tiny sense of an observer, but the observer isn't aware of a body of the observer. It's just a point of observation. So okay. you're, you're, you're just not picking up any sensations from your body. You're so out there in the infinite space and the same for the other three. Okay. That was my assumption, but I was a little confused when you said observer. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's more like a point of observation. There's a sense of, there's a sense of I'm looking at a big space, but there's no sense of I having a body. When you're in the movie theater and you're watching the ship sink and all those people are drowning, you're not thinking I've got a body here, right? You're completely lost in the sinking ship and all those poor people and you've just forgot about the body, right? Same thing. Uh, 
ask a little about uh, you, you. You said, I think, your opinion that um, there is no physical reality to, or I'm not sure if that's the right term. Ontological but, reality. Ontological reality to, to I think you were specifically speaking of the sixth jhana. But all, all four, all eight jhanas. So, well, I mean, the first, the, the Rupa jhanas are very intense versions of, of feelings that are, you know, mind right. states that we can, we can. Right. But, it, but they're not a realm that you go visit. You, you're not going to the heaven of jhana number one. All right. It's just a state that's happening in your mind. Okay, I'm hearing that, and uh, I'm not a. Um, I don't have any belief that it. Uh, well, I guess I'm starting to entertain beliefs that that uh, the Arupa John is at least six might be might be some, might have some physical reality or some reality on some plane. Just because, I mean, from a from a. Uh, standpoint of science, what would have created our ability to get to these places? Is there a natural selection reason for having these or is are we tuning into something that's external? How I come guess? the drain hole for your lower sinuses go up? Did we come from some place where gravity went in the other direction? Well, no. It's just a leftover thing from when we used to walk around with our faces aimed at the ground, right? We didn't evolve a drain hole going in the wrong direction. We just changed and it was a leftover thing. I think these jhanic states are leftover things. In other words, we didn't evolve them, but we evolved enough mechanism that if you play with it a different way than it was intended to, you can do something kind of nice. I mean, we didn't evolve, evolve to sing, right? Maybe we evolved to talk, but the singing in harmony, uh, Beethoven's Ode to Joy. I mean, you know, we didn't evolve, evolve to sing Beethoven's Ode to Joy, but we evolved in such a way that we were able to capitalize with what was there and do stuff that was far beyond why the thing evolved in the first place. And I think it's the same thing with the jhanas. We did evolve the ability to feel rewarded, okay, generate those neurotransmitters. And we're just hijacking that system to produce PT and Sukha and get into the first three jhanas. And then we banish it all. And that leaves us in the fourth jhana. These higher the, the jhanas, the immaterial states, seem to be just something that the mind can do to trick itself. We didn't evolve to have uh, hallucinations on LSD, but we do wind up with hallucinations on LSD. So there was nothing in our minds that was like, oh yeah, we got to get this together so we invent LSD, we can have hallucinations. It's just that the LSD managed to tap into our perceptual system in such a way that we start having hallucinations. What we're doing is tapping into our perceptual system in such a way that we're basically hallucinating an infinite space or infinite consciousness or whatever. I'm quite certain the Buddha did not think that the infinite space was a tapping into an ontologically existent infinite space. This is because there are the 10 unanswered questions and they are is the world eternal or not? Is the world infinite or not? Is the soul the same as the body or not? And what happens to a Tathagata, a fully awakened one after death? Exist, not exist, both exist and not exist, neither exist or not exist, right? So those are the 10 questions. Well, if the Buddha thought that infinite space was really out there, then he would have said the cosmos is infinite. 
you want to ask that question. And he's like, no, man, don't go asking silly questions like that. Do is your problem. So he clearly didn't think that infinite space was tapping into an ontologically infinite space, or he would have answered differently. Furthermore, in his talking about consciousness, he points out that consciousness is a dependently originated phenomena. It arises dependent on sensory input. So how are you going to type it, tap into an ontologically existent consciousness? I mean, how's it even going to exist unless it's getting sensory input? Where's, where are the senses for that ontologically existent infinite consciousness that's going to generate it? The Buddha's going, no, all consciousnesses are based on these six senses right here. That's where it comes from. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not buying ontologically existent jhanas. Maybe the, um, maybe we each have our own consciousness, but there's a place or a way that we can connect consciousnesses with other consciousnesses. Yeah, that, that's something that I can't disprove right now. And it's possible that's the case. And when you look at uh, Tibetan, you begin to get a sense of, yeah, I guess they're talking about that. Maybe uh, they don't quite put it like that. But there, there certainly is that tendency in later Buddhism to make that sort of jump. But in the suttas, nope, not, no evidence at all of anything like that. There is knowing the minds of others, but you you got my take on that, that that's ESP, whatever ESP is. So maybe ESP is real and we're able to tap into everything. But I've never been in the sixth jhana and learned anything about anybody. In fact, I've never been in the sixth jhana and learned anything except, wow, that's a big mind I've got now. I mean, that's the extent of my experience there, except for ooh, a little consciousness is over here, a little over there, but I don't know anything about them. There's nothing going on. Whereas I have had ESP experiences. Okay, now what was really going on, I can't say, but I have had those experiences and the sixth jhana is completely unlike any of them. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Sorry to disappoint you. And remember, this is just my opinion. I mean, the Buddha says, you know, don't get caught up in views and opinions. But this is what I have come to understand so far. And I know it's hard to believe, but occasionally I've been wrong. So I could be wrong about this. But this is, this is my best guess as to what's going on at this time. So then what is the reality? <laughs> so I remember long before I ever started practice, yeah, trying to understand what is reality. And I came up with the perfect definition of reality. Reality is that that exists independent of observation, which I think is a brilliant definition of reality. The only problem with it is you can't prove anything's real. So, so what is reality? That that exists independent of observation. Now, I do believe that there is actually a reality out there. And I actually have pretty good proof of that. And the proof is I'm not sick enough to have invented Donald Trump. Okay, that has to be coming from outside. I don't have anything that sick up here. What was your feeling in your body after coming out of the ninth jhana? Nothing extraordinary at all. It was just normal. You know, I'm just laying there in my bed. I had propped myself up a bit and I had my knees up. So they, they weren't, my legs weren't out straight. They were bent somewhat. And then, you know, it was just like, oh, that was cool. But I didn't even notice my body really. I mean, it, it seemed just like normal, just like, yeah. If you lay in a, in the position for, 
yeah, I was probably there an hour and a quarter or something like that. And yeah, it's comfortable and yeah, nothing noticeable. Please repeat that definition. Reality is that that exists. What? Indep independent of observation. Thank you. I think it really nails what we want reality to be, but it's totally useless for determining what reality is. Because all we know is what we observe. Is there a reason why... Um you recommend not not resolving to come out of the jhana before you do your insight um because just to, just to start doing it yeah i can't do insight in the jhana when i'm in the jhana i'm just in the jhana when i'm in fourth jhana i'm in this place where my mind is so quiet and so still all i can do is be quiet and still you know there's no ability to do anything so then i just start doing the insight practice and the jhana fades away you don't need to make it go away making it go away would be like you, get, you sharpen up the knife and then you you know scrape it on something to make it slightly dull before you start using it yeah, use, use the quiet stillness that you've got as part of your insight practice, as part of the base from which you do your insight practice. With When I first did jhana with Shaila, it was, it was really an exquisite feeling to feel the jhana draining away. I mean, that was like just as good as, as the jhana itself. And yeah, also, it, the, these days, it seems like uh, while my jhanas aren't nearly as intense as, as that, um, it, it seems like when I, I try to do insight practice right from jhana that it, yeah, I mean, okay, I guess you could say that I'm out of jhana because I wouldn't be able to do it if I was in jhana, but it just seems like my mind is kind of, I wouldn't say dull, but just it doesn't, it wants to just like go, ah. Yeah, <laughs> it's molasses. Yeah, yeah. And if that's the case and you got it and you feel like you need to come out, do something to get yourself moving again, then that's okay. That's fine. I just find that it's just really easy to just let go of the jhana and start doing the insight practice. But if you need to do something to get out of the molasses, yeah, go ahead and do it. Okay, thanks. I mean, I'm very much in favor of whatever works. You know, I'm giving you what works for me, what I think seems to be the the standard way to do these things, but your your mileage may vary. In fact, your mileage probably will vary. And you gotta experiment around and find what works for you. This is really wild. That's all. Yeah. It is. I mean, sit down. And yeah, just make yourself happy. I mean, like ecstatically happy. Then yeah, you know, kind of really happy. Then then, yeah, just contented. I mean, genuine, like not faking it. And then yeah, you know, get really quiet and still. And then do these other four weird things. Yeah, it's weird. The interesting thing is they have these same states in the Sufis. Now, whether the Sufis learned it from the Indians, we don't know, quite possibly. I mean, they're kind of hanging out in the same neck of the woods. But the Christian mystics also found the jhanas. Uh, Francisco de Asuna describes the states, states of prayer, of course, uh, very similar to what the Buddha described. So, yeah, this is what the mind likes to do when he gets quiet. Yeah. Kind of cool. You know, stop doing all the extraneous stuff that you're doing 
You just get quiet and your mind happens to go into a very happy place. That's, that's your natural state. All right, so it's 22 past, so 27 past, we'll do some metta. In order to begin, please put your attention on your breath for a few moments. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who seeks the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down free from drowsiness, one should sustain this mindfulness. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. 